we don't. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and this is the first keynote of our inaugural gaming and education conference. Peggy Shee is here. Without further ado, because we're behind time-wise, I'm going to turn it over to Peggy. Peggy, welcome and go. Thank you, thank you, and my apologies last time for um, for all the mishaps, but I'm very excited to be here, and it's quite an honor to be uh, kicking this off. There's so much chatter about games these days that um, it's really important that we hear each other and we get it right. So, um, as you know, my um, many of you know anyway, my background was really um, in virtual worlds, and that's really kind of where I established a foothold of um, of in investigating and exploring new frontiers for learning. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that I practiced everything I say tonight because I'm going to get a little cranky at some points um, by setting the tone. There's a, there's a sign on my classroom door that, that says um, a million computers cannot replace one good teacher. And I truly believe that. But I also believe in something I read from um, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach. And she said, um, technology will not replace teachers, but teachers who know how to use technology effectively to help their students create and connect and collaborate together online will replace those who do not. And the technology I'm going to speak to tonight is video games. And I really think that um, that statement from Cheryl kind of sets the tone properly for where I want to go with this discussion. Um, as you know, or as many of you know, I'm not exactly representative of the age most associated with video games. And so I've relied really heavily on the experts um, to inform me and advise me of my own design. And some, but not all, of these experts will be quoted in this presentation. But I hope you will avail yourself of their work. Um, but one thing that's consistent through all these people is that they all agree that gaming will dominate the 21st century, and we can already see it happening. So again, I'm going to warn you right up front that some of my ideas or feelings um, may seem a little radical or um, maybe a little cranky, but that's what I do. I try things. I try things with kids. I see what works, what doesn't work, and I report back. So um, really quickly. I'm going to go through through these, but these slides will be available to you so you can really do this on your own. But these are some of the experts that informed my work for, from the very beginning. And Mark is the guy, you give Mark's book to the um, uninitiated. Um, you give Mark's book to the parent who doubts that they, they, there's any substantial learning in video games. Um, and then when you're ready and you start to really see the stuff that's happening and you're kind of curious about the, the real research behind it, you can move on to Jim G. And, um, and his, his book, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy, literally became my Bible for a while. Um, Jenny Shell is just, uh, and, and again, if you see that little TED Talk um, icon in, in the bottom, you know that there is one sitting for them. But Jenny Shell um, has took game design and led research projects at Honey Mellon. Um, since I think 2002, but he's also CEO of a really large video game studio, Shell Games, and he's the former chairman of an international game developers association. So he sounds like this really big, serious guy. Um, but before he got to Carnegie Mellon, he was the creative director of Disney Virtual Reality Studio, where he spent seven years as a designer and programmer. And you know, he was one of those guys, and. He's a juggler, and he's a comedian, and he was at one point named one of the world's top 100 innovators um, by the Technology Review of MIT's Magazine of Innovation. So I pay attention when Jesse talks, but mostly Jesse just makes sense, and he seems to have this beautiful gift of really narrowing everything down to simple terms. Um, Stuart Brown will take you through the whole concept of play and how play is just much more than something trivial or something um, inconsequential. He's a pioneer in that research. And um, he actually started, this is kind of interesting, he started his research through, um, he was researching murders. Um, 
and he found that the one consistent thing when he looked at the background of all these serial killers was that they didn't have playtime in their youth. They didn't have a situation where they were allowed to play. And he also looks at animal, the animal life, and, and how the the um, animals learn to survive through play. Mothers train their, their, their young through play. Um, and he, he kind of shows us how we can bring that over and apply that then to the human species. Um, Constance from Games Learning and Society out in Madison, Wisconsin, was also at the White House for, um, I think, 18 months. And it was Constance's research that first got me tuned into uh, literacy and um, using MMOs like World of Warcraft to increase it. And um, her research available online is, is just really fascinating. She did a lot of work with uh, World of Warcraft and I think 10th grade boys. And um, I tried to put the link in there for you. She also ran a MOOC not too long ago with um, Kurt Squire, her partner. And that was very well received as well. And then there's everybody's darling, Jane McGonigal, who basically stood up on a TED stage and said, if we want to save the world, we have to play more video games. And of course, what she was really talking about was the um, the attitude or the disposition of this whole generation of game players. That's something that if we could harness it and direct it towards real world problems, we'd have a serious force to be reckoned with. Um, John Tilly Brown is just a really smart guy, and I, I really love listening to him. He's got a lot of videos out there, but he's the guy that said, I'd rather hire a high-level World of Warcraft player than a Harvard MBA, because he basically understood from his work all of the qualities that you want in your modern business in the world today are present in someone who has managed to um, to get to that end end game level in a uh, complicated and, and complex massively multiplayer online game. So um, let's get down to the real experts, though. These are my kids and. These are the ones that really inform me, because they'll tell you. They'll tell you, that's not right, that's too hard, why are you using those words? Um, we don't learn that way, that doesn't make any sense, why don't we just do this? And I get real fundamental feedback and advice from those kids. And I don't know why we don't make it a habit as educators to always include the students in the design process. Whether you're designing a uh, an English lesson or a... PE lesson or a whole curriculum, those are basically our clients, per se, and we need to hear them. They need to be at the table. Um, this is a movie, I hope it will play, that one of my students made for me. I said to him, I need to talk to teachers, and I need to show them what you guys play outside of school. So could you so just... it will play very yes. poorly because it's going through this screen share. Is it on YouTube? Okay, so it's not no, going to... it's not. It's not going to show. So we'll just skip it. Okay, we'll just skip it then. Um, I don't think I put it on YouTube. And if, if I did, I don't want to look for it now. But basically, it's this, you know, high action, beautiful, lush um, graphics, great music, Lots of information coming at you, Twitch feed on the screen, um, selection of games from, um, from everything from Minecraft to Halo to Assassin's Creed to World of Warcraft, um, just indicative of how complex these games are, you know, how exciting they are, how they demand your attention and your full focus, and in order to be successful with them, how much information you are taking in and calculating and, and, and it's generating your next move and all this is happening in Twitch speed. And then we give them this and say, let's play games in school. Now, of course, you know, I'm the queen of the extreme example, but it's really quite true that um, we dumb everything down for them. And 
if you look at the whole piece, every every game design or game um, presentation has to have this picture in it. It's just mandatory. Um, but I think if, if we remember to fully understand the potential of games in education, we're going to need to start to think creatively about what education and gaming might look like in the future. And I feel that there are some big changes that need to happen if we're ever going to realize the promise of game-based learning. Can I use my soapbox is coming out? No, nah, it's long overdue. Um, I feel we need to aggressively counter the hype that misinformed members of mass media are filling people's heads with, especially parents. We, we have to be evangelists advocating for what we believe is best for kids. And at every and any possible juncture, we should be documenting what we do, gathering as much data from what we do with kids and games, and always include the student perspective. Because if we don't understand that we need to acknowledge that the games industry has got to develop its reputation beyond the sometimes perceived obsession with first-person shooters. Like, sometimes that's all people know about video games is just first-person shooters. And we need to encourage them to explore the wider and more complex realms of human activity. Some of the larger game design companies are doing just that, like Steam EDU, turned around and took a step in the right direction with, with Valve releasing Portal 2 to educators for free. And that's a, like a really cool physics game. And um, EA, Electronic Arts, has recently been working with Glass Labs on a project involving The Sims, The Sims EDU. And um, I haven't had sufficient time with that, so the, the jury's kind of out with it. But um, according to Glass Labs, it's been very well received. Um, and their focus, though, is on assessment and how do we build in assessment in an ethical manner that it's not something separate and artificial from the game. And if they really, if they succeed in that, full on kudos, I'll be on top of the mountain screaming how wonderful they are because that's really key to this whole piece. Um, but none of the big players have stepped up and said, oh, let us build the games you need. You know, and therefore, we're kind of reliant on our biggest hope, which to date is the independent, the little indie games. Um, they always seem to manage every year to produce, like, a few gems. Um, Journey was a magnificent game, just a beautiful, beautiful game. And um, at one point, you could actually collaborate, but it was, it was limited in its scope, and you really had to be introspective and... Um, and then the game on Gone Home is, is a, a killer game, but it's all curiosity. You're not shooting anything. You're not leveling up. It's all about investigating and, and looking and using your, your sense of um, investigation. And um, later on, I'll be referring to uh, a guy named Paul Dervasi who's made an incredible game in his classroom, using this as the foundation. Um, Bastion is a beautiful game. And, of course, we have Minecraft, but then <laughs> we're not quite sure what Minecraft is going to do. So this is Paul Dervasi. And um, I first met Paul at Games in Education, which is a terrific conference, by the way, every summer in upstate New York, somewhere around Troy. And it's free, and it's sponsored by a, a company called... Um, First Playable Productions, and Paul said he was going to, his little clip about his presentation just said something about a game that he designed in order to, to uh, take his senior year English students who he said had already checked out and bring them back and get them engaged with the novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I'm telling you, I listened to this man present and I was just wrapped with his passion and his he, at one point, like, his, his eyes filled up, and that's how emotional he was about his students. And it's that kind of passion that yielded this kind of amazing game. Now, the picture you're looking at, he literally sits down at his desk with this look of, you know, Nurse Cratchit, 
and develops this game where the kids actually say, you know, just like in the book where nobody knew who to trust and what to do next and who you could talk to and who you couldn't talk to, like that was the actual atmosphere of our classroom and it was like creepy but it was engaging and it was it was pretty amazing at what it was what it was and um this is one of the best examples of that term gamification in education that I have come across I mean this is the example that really works for me now there's his um where he blogs. He blogs at ludiclearning.org. And if you read his blog from start to finish, it should be a book. It's just a beautiful education in why games work in school, how to get games into school, what the thinking is behind picking a game and using the right game, what your student feedback might be like, um, taking those chances, taking those risks. Now, interestingly enough, both um, Marianne Malmstrom and I were invited to the White House <laughs> to participate in this um, game jam last weekend. And unfortunately, the timing was such that we were invited too late to get our clearance, so we were just kind of following it on Twitter and, and trying to figure out who was there and what was happening. Um, but we really need to understand that new ways of working and whole new forms of collaboration are going to be required between our entertainment and our education sectors and that this in turn may require new economic and commercial models to be developed and we're not quite sure what they might look like but we have to be open to that possibility um, and there's starting to be a lot of folks that they're, they're trying to do this but this game jam I thought was a really good example where over 100 game developers were invited to the White House to meet with educators. Now, they were missing the student ingredient. They brought it in the next day. But, I mean, students need to be there from the beginning. You don't start the design and then bring the kids in to give you testing feedback. You let the kids help with the design. Um, but, um, there were, there were some big indie, indie people there. There were people there um, from Angry Birds and uh, Ubisoft's Red Storm. The only thing that rubbed me wrong was their task was outlined very clearly that, um, that it was a 48-hour event challenging developers and designers with making games in different subject areas that adhered to the common core standards. Now, the quote from the guy, um, Chad Sansing, who is the education advisor from the White House for the Game Jam, was very positive and, and gave me a lot of hope. He said, let's encourage our kids and push ourselves to become ambassadors for game-based learning. Let's curate and share examples of games that are difficult and reward the kind of critical problem-solving academic tasks do not. Let's make do until we make a better future for games in the classroom and a more purposeful and critical community of gamers and game makers in our school. Gamers and game makers in our school. But therein lies the problem for me. Because with that wonderful and hopeful blog post, we're still building on the precedent that we need to align these to the common core standards. And regardless of where you sit with the common core standards, we could have a pretty wild debate over that. But moving forward under the assumption that the common core standards are viable and are a good thing for our children and learning is dubious at best for me. And also, once again, this change that we so desperately need continues to happen in lots of small bursts. For example, these game jam efforts, while noble in intent, they serve to point out the real problem in educational game development. And the real problem is the big companies with the deep pockets have looked the other way. And not one of them seems to want to step in with the financial muscle really needed to build games that are just as sexy as the games kids play outside of school that will serve our purposes as educators. <sighs> There's my soapbox. 
because they have the money, folks. They have the money, and they just haven't decided that education is going to be something that will keep that profit margin where they want it to be. Um, so who's going to step in? I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the next logical step is, you guessed it. More than likely, it's going to be the folks who've already gotten their claws into every aspect of education, from the development of the standards to the supporting materials for the standards and the curriculum for the standards and even the instrument with which the whole fiasco is measured. And the people who have no pedagogical background nor any connection to our students other than a purse string are making all the decisions and those big bucks that used to go into the development of textbooks I looked this up at a widely used industry estimate for the average investment to create the master copy of one textbook is $750,000. Now think about these companies that make, what, 90 textbooks a year, maybe more, maybe a few less. That big lump sum of money is just sitting there and they're just waiting to seize the opportunity to jump on the next product that's likely to take the textbook place, and that's going to be educational games. And those publishing companies are primed to shift those millions of dollars previously spent on developing textbooks to this next entity they can monopolize and serve up to public education. Yeah, the, the serious games, the educational games, and dare I say, every ounce of joy will get sucked right out of gaming as it has with every other aspect of learning because the boys in suits who don't know squat about pedagogy or about our students will be making all the decisions once again. And the saddest part is many teachers will buy in because either they won't have the experience to see the differences in a well-designed game or a piece of junk or an interactive worksheet or an incentivized skill and drill, solve this and you earn time to play the game entity. Oh, I'm really glad I got all that out. So those games, oh, here's a case in point. <laughs> the most beautiful indie game that's come down the pipe in our lifetime, Minecraft. It's ubiquitous. Every kid plays it, knows about it, reads about it, blogs about it, does YouTube videos about it, studies it, studies the mods for it. And Microsoft's buying it. <laughs> and I'm going to stop there because the next few things I want to say, I know that Mary and Nelson is going to want to say them. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop there. <sighs> oh, but the emperor has no clothes, folks. He's naked. And if we don't realize that this corporate takeover of games and education, just like the corporatization of higher education is happening, and we don't do something to try and alleviate it and take back our classrooms and our vocations, then we have nothing to complain about and we have no voice in complaining about it when what they hand us is some kind of pablum where our kids look at it and go, well, this sucks, but it's better than a worksheet. And then we have the buzzwords. You know, I mentioned gamification, and then we have the, you know, the right brain thinking and the sage on the stage and the digital natives and disruptive technology and college and career ready and um, flipping and future proofing and, uh, and grit, my favorite, grit. And you know what? These, uh, <laughs> these buzzwords are like, blinding us from, like, speaking to each other and talking about what we really need to talk about, which is what's going to work best for this generation of kids. And, you know, if, if we look at um, these terms, gamification and game-based learning, you know, we can really trip ourselves up because they're both buzzwords or buzz phrases, um, but... And each can offer your classroom something very legitimate, but most people mistake one for the other. Can you tell the difference? Um, the standard accepted definition of gamification 
um, is the application of game mechanics to non-game entities to encourage a specific behavior or enact change. And I found this great article from someone named Margaret Robertson where she discussed the problems of our trending gamification bandwagon. And she explained that um, what she thinks is that the problem is what we currently call gamification is, in fact, nothing more than the process of taking the thing that is least essential to games, points, and badges, and representing it as the core of the experience. Points and badges have no closer relationship to games than they do to websites and fitness apps and loyalty cards. They're great tools for communicating progress, and they are great for acknowledging effort, but neither points nor badges in any way constitute a game. Games just use them as primary school teachers and military hierarchies and coffee shops have for centuries to help people visualize the things they might otherwise lose track of. They're the least important bit of the game and the bit that has the least to do with all the rich cognitive, emotional, and social drivers which gamifiers are intending to connect with. So then what are we talking about here? What is this game-based learning? Okay, the definition of game-based learning is simply learning through games. It's not obsessing over video games, nor does it absolutely require you or your students play the games, though ideally you would. It also doesn't require video games. That would be video game-based learning. It's simply the use of the inherent game design of most games in your learning and teaching. So learn what? That depends. It could be simply becoming better at the game, but in most educational settings, students are instead learning something academic and some non-academic content at the same time by playing these games. So when does it make sense to use this? It makes sense to use it when you want to repackage academic content, when you want to promote critical and strategic thinking, when you want to engage students who are not otherwise engaged, when you want to provide context for learning, contextual learning, here's the idea. Let's put it into context so you can feel it, live it, do it, breathe it. Okay, or to support both struggling and talented students. I've used WOW in school with World of Warcraft with both my learning center kids who have been actually identified as having learning disabilities, and my gifted and talented. So among the ideal uses of all this game-based learning is like historical simulations, like Civilization V, which is just this awesome game, um, which allows students to kind of sit with and analyze and interact with um, the rise and fall of um, civilizations that otherwise they, they might struggle with that complexity. All right, does everybody need like a, a little bit of break from the uh, intense, the passion, the, so there you go, there's my break. Now I can't see the chat screen, so I don't know if you're laughing or not, but. There isn't laughing, but there's a lot of serious commenting and interest. We do have to finish in Good. six minutes. Okay, we can do it, I can do it. So. We basically have this situation now where the world or the education world is starting to identify the fact that games might have something to offer our learning, um, but we've got these two different perspectives. You know, we've got the people who think it's glasses half full, um, and they see that children whose attention wandered are now focused, and they see that um, that uh, that um, I guess the only way to put it that they see that all of a sudden these kids are engaged and they want to be there and they're and they're feeling positive and they're taking ownership of their learning. Um, so for this group, something uh, of a like a similar to the quest for the Holy Grail has begun. Where are we going to find those games that are going to do that same thing that we can bring into school? You know, those games are going to be just as rich and sexy and engaging as the ones kids play outside of school. And this glass half full perspective is going to acknowledge that all these skills and capabilities that kids are learning with these games are the exact skills that are required in this creative economy 
of this new world that they're going to be entering. But then we have those other furrowed brow, half-empty folks who are saying, like, no, 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 that's not engagement, that's addiction. And no, 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 that's not um, competition, it's social dysfunction, and it's isolation. And for those people, you know, they're the ones that only see the guns and the demons, and they never get beyond into the substance of the game and the learning that's happening within. But don't get me wrong, there's also huge barriers in acceptance from some very practical standpoints. Very often it's the teachers. It's the teachers who have difficulty in identifying the relevance of a particular game or finding a game that will support their mandatory curriculum. Um, they aren't given time to familiarize themselves with games, much less have professional development. And of course, there is difficulty in persuading the other school stakeholders as to the actual educational benefits of the computer games. Even if you figured it out, now you've got to convince your boss. Um, I'm going to skip forward. Um, so basically, what we have to realize is, you know, that the time has come where we have to take the whole idea of play and the whole idea of work, and we should have been like separated and, and a major rift between them, and bring them back together, you know, and I think if we take a look at what we're talking about with play, I mean, there's an indisputable body of research supporting the role of play in learning. And it seems that education still maintains the ideas of work and play as distinctly polarized. And therefore, play and learning are at odds in the basic mindset of many educational stakeholders. But let's talk about play. And this is a, uh, a slide I got from Lucas Gillespie. And, you know, and he said, take, go back and remember the sandbox, you know. Therein lies the paradox. We're missing the connection. We've pitted hard, meaningful work against the supposed empty frivolity of play. And it's endemic in our culture's thinking about play, not only in the workplace, but also in education. But what else do the game designers get that we don't seem to get? Think about it. The sandbox. Are these kids learning? Are there rules? How do they learn the rules? Is there limitations on what they can create? Are they learning about uh, multiple layers of collaboration and negotiation and shared cognition? But wait a minute, where's the textbook? Where's the teacher? Where's the notes? Where's the, there's learning going on, okay? So then what sort of assessment would you use? There's the A word. What sort of assessment would you use for this kind of learning? Because, you know, if we value it, we must assess it. You know, I, I love this slide. Is this kid learning? I had one science teacher raise his hand once when I was presenting and say, that's um, surface tension, surface tension. But the same thing. Remember I told you about Stuart Brown who said, you know, it all tracks back to the animal kingdom and, and play and watching that dog run down the beach with a wild sense of abandon. It, that's how they keep healthy. That's how they keep their... Um, neuroplasty in their brains going. Um, now, I'm not going to venture into talking to you about neuroscience because maybe way out of my league, but um, do avail yourself of the work of Stuart Brown because what happens to us is as we become adults, taking time to play feels like a guilty pleasure, like a distraction from real work and life. But Dr. Brown says it, it's as biological a drive, as integral to our health as sleep or nutrition. So, in fact, his research points to our ability to play throughout life as the single most important factor in determining our health, our success, and our happiness. So, I'm so confused. Jesse, Jesse Shells, you know, says, I'm so confused. Um, everything's changing. Our standards are changing. The technology is evolving and changing. We can barely keep up with it. And when you think of games and other tools for learning, the delivery systems are changing. Let's face it, our students have changed and their parents have changed. The world has changed. But I think we can all agree that it, there's a pretty strong evidence that education must change and needs to change. And if we're to serve a purpose in this brave new world, we must also evolve and embrace the changes the world is seeing that science and the corporate sector have already harnessed. And still, education digs its heels in and leans back and crosses its arms and frowns, grimacing over its glasses and stares down the face of change and says, no, nope, it's not broken. I'm not going to fix it. So if we look at our kids and we come full circle and say, 
don't they deserve that we reimagine what education should look like for them? It certainly shouldn't look like the industrial age model that exists, and why can't it be fun? And just as it shouldn't look like an industrial age model, it also shouldn't only be game-based, because once again, if we do that, we're deciding how the kids will learn rather than offering them choices and establishing some semblance of agency. Games are not the magic elixir or silver bullet to fix all of education's woes. They're one tool, one particular method that you could use in your classroom. So um, I'm going to fast forward here in the interest of time and just remind you that everyone is a gamer now. It's almost a silly term to have because with the onslaught of mobile games and everything that's going on with games on our cell phones, games on our tablets, everybody's gaming. You know, your grandmother's gaming, your mother's gaming, your sister's gaming, your kids are gaming, even if it's only in the little, what we call life's little intermissions. And if you're not paying attention to mobile gaming, then you're not paying attention because there are things coming out of the, into the mobile market now that are just breathtaking and complex and beautiful. So why do we do all this? We do all this because when we're in that game state, we experience things like flow and the happiness factor, and the game industry knows this, and they know just how to design it in, how much can they take before they're bored, what's too hard, what's too easy. And they get it. And if we could just figure that out in education, we'd have that Sierra moment, that yes, that fist pump moment. Um, but how do we do it? How do we get them to play these complex and hard games? We get it by introducing it a little bit at a time, with one thing at a time. Educators and parents still often make that distinction, though, between a time for learning and a time for play, instead of seeing the vital connection between them. And people, I mean, C.R. Papert turned around and said, you know, people give lip service to learning to learn, but if you look at curriculum in schools, most of it's about dates, fractions, and science facts. Very little of it is about learning. So again, um, Jim G. looks at the literacy piece. Um, he looks at engagement. He looks at failure. And he looks at um, the social network, because learning is no longer an isolated event. And if we come full circle, what we have here is an opportunity for an epic win. Um, if we open our eyes, and we pay attention, and we play the games to get a feel for them, and we talk to the kids about what games they play and why, um, that's really the direction in which we should be going. And you know, I mean, watch a kid play a video game. Watch your own kids play. If you don't have kids, borrow some. And if you can't do that, go to your local public library on gaming night. And if they don't have a gaming night, ask them why not. Because even though the kids may be masters of the gaming interface, you're the master of learning. And it's that combination that we need. So we need you to play the games, investigate the games, get in there and play. And put on your teacher lens and make sure that you can really correlate what you're seeing happening in the game to something that you want your kids to know or be able to do. And very often you can do that just by lurking, just by hanging out and watching. Um, Off-the-shelf games have so much to offer. Don't be afraid of them. Um, because what we have here is a generation of kids, I call them gifted hoodlums, and they're truly going to um, be the generation that turns around and says, you know, we, we don't want to learn that way, we want to learn this way. Um, I'm going through some slides here just to show you other options for you, um, and we could talk about them at length, but there's free alternatives like Lord of the Rings Online, and keep your goals, your instructional goals in mind. Um, they're starting to develop um, game aggregators where you can go and you can say, well, I want um, for everyone age 10 and over um, some, a game that's going to support science um, on the mobile Android phone. And so these, these, these aggregators, and there's quite a few of them now, are really going to be helpful. Um, but also, you know, 
if you're new to gaming, that's okay. You're allowed to be new. Allow yourself to ask the hard questions. Allow yourself to say, I don't get it. Give yourself that permission to be the noob. Um, adopt your play ethic, and today you have an opportunity to really move into something very auspicious and very life-changing. And my six minutes is up. <laughs> because it's really not half empty and it's not half full. Um, there's, there's no simple answer to it. It's a matter of realizing that we're simply overflowing with opportunity now, and um, we need to take advantage of that opportunity. So I'm sorry that there's no time for discussion and questions. I'm going to escape this so that I can kind of see the chat now. And, um, God, I feel like I really powered through that. Um, I, I, expect that I, I expect that I got some pretty um, diabolical feedback because I know I really went, went to an extreme side of the fence this time, but it was time for me to do it. I had to do it. Thank you. We're going to let people go. If you want to, you can leave this room open, and uh, we're going to stop the recording. But you can you go up to File, Save, and Save the Chat, and see the chat. Or you can, when the recording is up, you can actually watch the full recording with the chat. Thank you, Peggy. Fascinating. Thank you, and I'm so sorry about all the technical difficulties, guys. Thanks, everybody. OK, I put the link to Bron Stuckey's session in the chat. I'm going to turn the recording off. And uh, we'll have you move over there. Take care. Bye, Peggy. Bye.